Dressing oilseed rape this week as farmers throughout the east of England take advantage of some drier weather to get on the land. And I was one of them, but were we doing the right thing? There's a lot of argument at the moment about the fertiliser requirements of rape, especially P and K. That argument is our main subject today. And later in the programme, I shall be talking to John Archer of ADAS and John Edwards, a consultant agronomist with the Cotswold firm of Cleanacres. In part two, we have a progress report on the winter wheat crop on the farm that makes a habit of breaking records. But we start with oilseed rape. Ten years ago, it was almost unknown in this country. Since then, the area planted has expanded dramatically. And last autumn, an estimated 117,000 hectares, or well over a quarter of a million acres, were drilled. This is an increase of almost 20% on the previous year. And many believe that this acreage could double within another ten years. But has our knowledge of the crop's fertilizer requirements kept pace with this headlong expansion, or are most farmers using recommendations based on insufficient research? That's the question we'll return to in a few minutes. But first, David Sorday reports from a couple of farms in Suffolk to find out how much fertilizer they were using on their rape crops. The land at Red House Farm Stradbrook in Suffolk is fairly heavy clay loam. But by lunchtime on Monday, it had dried out sufficiently for Robert Hawes to start top dressing. 60 of his 270 acres are down to oilseed rape, and they were to get their first application of nitrogen. Nitro chalk is preferred on this farm because he finds that to some extent it counteracts the acidifying effects of the top dressing. So after a dry weekend, the tractor and spreader had little difficulty in traveling on normal tires without causing any noticeable damage. The variety here is Jet Nerf, drilled last August after winter barley. With a mild winter so far, the crop was looking well forward and continued growth in January had made some early nitrogen seem imperative. But the crop's complete fertiliser regime had begun at drilling time, as Robert Hawes explained. In the seedbed, we put uh, 50 units each of phosphate and potash, uh, but contrary to the usual application of nitrogen in the seabed, we only put in 20 units. Uh, it was said at the time that there was quite a good reservoir of nitrogen uh, available from previous crops, and so I took the risk of reducing from the normal 50 units down to 20, and so far it doesn't seem to have suffered at all. I don't recollect uh, being able to put any top dressing on in January in any previous year, and here we are just into February, and I'm delighted to be able to get some early top dressing onto a crop. It's a tendency that seems to be increasingly common, which is uh, contrary to what ADAS and so on would recommend. <laughs> yes, but in a situation where one is more aware of the requirements uh, around the farm, the, the different crops, both for fertiliser and to get on when necessary with some fungicides or some herbicides, even though it is relatively early and we may lose a little, but only a small proportion through leaching, we want to be able to get on as soon as we can and be on top of the work. How much are you putting on today? We're putting on 55 units of nitrogen here. And the bolt would go on when? Uh, we would expect to be able to come back and put some more on uh, at the more traditional time in, in March. And uh, we shall probably come on the beginning of March and then again towards the end of March to give a total dressing of the order of 200 units. You said you put potash into the seed bed, I think um, quite a considerable number of units. Now that's another area that uh, ADAS say that if you've got a good potash reservoir, you perhaps needn't put a dressing on at all. Yes, uh, good point that, but uh, we have just recently uh, had the whole farm sampled for a uh, P and K analysis and uh, depending on the result of that, the, then it might colour our uh, applications next year. But for now, we're, we're, we've been going on quite merrily with a rotational um, application of P and K's uh, commensurate with the 
what we've been carting off in the previous crops and to restore the normal reservoir. Potash is one area where opinions diverge, and that perhaps indicates the amount there still is to be learnt about oilseed rape. Despite nine years' experience growing the crop, Robert Hawes still feels that more experimental work needs to be done in the eastern region. I would be delighted to see some uh, trial work uh, being laid down in this area for rape growers in this area. Um, if, if we could have some work done, for example, at Norfolk Agricultural Station, this would be lovely. And presumably work out some sort of growing system like the Lou or the schleswig holstein that we've got for wheat. Well, yes, let's call it the Suffolk system then, yes. But systems have to be adapted for different soil types. Only 20 miles away at Kings Farm, Wesselton, the land changes to sand. Not surprisingly then, on the same afternoon, conditions were ideal for applying an early dressing of 60 units of nitrogen. The variety is Rafal, and it's part of 93 acres being grown on this and adjoining fields. It had all been drilled by the 20th of August with 50 units of NP and K in the seedbed. Rape crops in this area are vulnerable to bird damage. But as Glenn Ogilvy explained, so far damage had been slight. Well, we've been very lucky this year. We haven't seen many pigeons uh, at all. We had a lot of damage two years ago, but I think if you can keep them off the growing points of the crop, it doesn't seem to have too disastrous an effect. The spread of rape growing onto the lighter lands has been fairly recent. Glenn Ogilvy first grew the crop some three years ago, but soon realised that his lighter soils were just not suitable. I tried it on some very, very light land last year, what, uh, what some of my friends refer to as egg timer land, uh, and it was not a success. Uh, we had a very early drought, coupled with the fact that I never got the crop in in good time, as we did this year, uh, and I don't think I would try it on that land again unless I could be absolutely certain of getting it in very early, middle of August. Both Glen Ogilvy and Robert Hawes are members of the Suffolk-based cooperative United Framlingham Farmers, and they take advice on fertiliser policy from their crops division, United Farm Production, or UFP. So it's not surprising that the nitrogen policy on the two farms is similar. We'll start with 50 units in the seed bed. Uh, I like to give it some nitrogen to start because it, if we do get it in in good time, as I sincerely hope we will do, uh, it's got hopefully quite a long growing period before it becomes dormant through the winter months. I like to get on it as early as possible as we're doing now in the spring uh, to give it 50, 60 units to try and get it growing. And then as soon as we start seeing real signs of growth, of the crop growing away, then the big lump, another 150 units or thereabouts, goes on. Views on potash levels are slightly more contentious. And I wondered if they really needed all the 50 units that had gone into the seedbed. On this land we do, yes. Our potash readings are always low, generally zeros or ones. And nitrogen right at the start of the season rather than midway through the autumn. This has been the recommendation I've had from UFP, for who, well, through who I grow the, the rape, uh, and it's been successful, and therefore I've stuck with it. And that's what most farmers seem to do. Certainly the two that I visited were achieving adequate yields based on proven fertiliser policy, and I suspect it would have to be pretty convincing evidence to make either of them change. David Sorday reporting from a couple of farms where, with the exception of the split nitrogen dressings, the fertiliser regime seemed to be broadly in line with ADAS recommendations. In simplified form, this is what ADAS recommend. 160 to 190 units of nitrogen, 30 to 60 units of phosphate, about the same of potash, with sulphur not necessary. Contrast that with the recommendations John Edwards gives his clients. While the nitrogen is broadly the same, he goes for a lot more phosphate, a huge amount of potash, and 20 to 30 units of sulphur. The cost of these two systems is very different, but if you take the middle range of recommendations, the additional cost of John Edwards' program would be about 20 pounds an acre. If you use the very high levels he recommends in certain situations, the extra cost would be near 35 pounds an acre. The advocates of these two very different systems are with me now. John Archer, we've seen a couple of chaps top dressing nitrogen. Were they doing the right thing? In the circumstances of this season, I think so, yes. We normally recommend nitrogen when spring growth begins, and that's happened in this season. I thought ADAS said that splitting your top dressing of nitrogen was a waste of time. 
in a more normal season when we are putting on nitrogen at the end of February, then yes. But the snag is for us farmers, unless ADAS can tell us which is going to be a normal season and which isn't, it's difficult to know. Obviously there's variation between seasons and one has to make a judgement depending on circumstances. Getting on to potash and phosphate, uh, what are your feelings about the use of potash? Our experimental work has given us the indication that it's only in very low potash situations, low soil potash situations, that we get a yield response. So the chap we saw on the film now whose potash index was nil to one, you'd say he was doing about the right thing putting on 50 units? I think he's justified in at least that amount at index naught, but several of our sites at index one haven't shown a worthwhile yield response, so it's just a maintenance application of that sort of level. And phosphate, you wouldn't disagree with his 50 units? No, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Well, then the last question really is, is sulphur. Have any of your work shown that sulphur makes any sense? We know that the rape crop demands a fair amount of sulphur, more than most of our other arable crops. But the work that's been done in this country to date would indicate that there is very little likelihood of much in the way of response to be found. Now, there may be odd sites that respond, but it's not a general problem. John Edwards, you've put the cat among the pigeons, at least those pigeons who aren't eating the rape. Um, do you disagree about the nitrogen levels we've been seeing this afternoon? No, I didn't think there was much quibble or argument there. Then, going on to the potash and phosphate, clearly you are in quite substantial disagreement with ADAS and with the farmers we've seen. Yes. Uh, research work using tagged potash in particular has shown that the crop will take up up to 15 or 16 units per day for something like 30 or 40 days from flowering onwards. And if you haven't got that already in your soil, then you must put it down if you want to get the very best crops. But are you seriously telling me that the chap we were looking at, who's obviously jolly low on potash, should have been putting on 350 units? Because that's a heck of a lot. Certainly 200 plus. I wouldn't like to go further than that without seeing a soil analysis. But you wouldn't be unhappy at 200 plus? No. Because Fison's tell me that uh, potash is not necessary at all. Here they disagree with John Archer. And in fact, I don't use potash myself. Am I being dumb? I've seen one or two of your soil analyses, and I think you would find potash very beneficial. Uh, as far as phosphate, you don't feel that more than 100 acres is often necessary, do you? Not very often, no. But if your crop is going to go to the high yields, and I'm talking of being satisfied when you're over 30 hundred weights, not under, then you've got to get the basic structure of the plant right. And if you haven't got adequate potash, uh, phosphate, you won't get proper rooting and you won't get proper uptake of moisture and all the other nutrients. You also feel that sulphur is necessary. Now, it has been suggested that in the part of the world you come from, which is to the west of the industrial bits, you don't get the sort of fallout from the sky that we would hear. Is there any validity in that? Well, that may be true, but it really is an irrelevant factor anyway. The point about sulphur is that sulphur is only taken up from the soil as sulphate, and when you get very cold soils, or anaerobic or acidic wet soils, the sulphate is converted to other sulphite sulphides, and the crop can't utilize those. How do I put on, assuming I want to put on 20 or 30 units of sulphur in the spring, as you suggest, how do I physically do it? Put on a sulphur-rich fertilizer, put Would on phosphate, and don't bother to put phosphate down with your next year's wheat. What happens if you're on high pH soils which have a sort of lock-up where you in danger of losing the phosphate. Use ammonium sulphate. Um, John Archer, going on to cost for a moment, we've seen that obviously John Edwards' ideas are going to cost quite a bit more, somewhere between 20 and 35 quid more, and it, with rate being worth £12.50 a hundred weight, do you think that the extra inputs are going to be repaid by extra outputs? In short, no, because if one's not getting a yield response, and this is the basis of our information from our experimental work that, particularly on the potash story, we don't find a yield response to above the rates of potash that we're recommending. And if there is no yield response to be gained, then I fail to see how one's going to get an economic benefit to it. Are you happy that the trials that have been carried out by you and by everybody else, if it comes to that, have paid enough attention to potash poor soils? This is one of the criticisms that's been levelled at you. Well, in the ADAS series of experiments I referred to, of 22 sites testing potash, nine were at index one. Now, in most people's terminology, that would be a low potash soil. So I don't think we've excluded that end of the scale at all. And certainly Fison's work, which 
again was covered a range of soils, included several sandy soils at low potash levels. I see. John Edwards, the correspondence that have, you've been having in the press recently has suggested that the trials work that's been done in England has been insufficient. A proportion of the trials work to which I have been referred in this country has been based on fallacious basis. For example, some of the Fison's work on sulphur, the sulphur was applied in the autumn. If you apply it in the autumn, it's still going to be converted from sulphate to the other sulphur compounds, and therefore will still be unavailable. But w the trials work that your research is based on, were they, were they was that carried out on the continent? No, I have looked at research on the continent, but we have carried out work in the south of England, and typical was a result on the Cotswolds, 23% yield increase. When we talk of potash, some have been quantified. We've had substantial yield increases, some when it came to the point the combine just went through and the farmer said, yes, by God, that paid. So really you're saying that whilst you're a wee bit dissatisfied with the trials work other people have been doing, you're not dissatisfied with the trials work you've been doing? Uh, that would be fair. <laughs> and would you echo the opposite point of view then, that it's the other chap who's at fault and, and your trials work is unimpeachable? Because well, it leaves a farmer like me scratching his head wondering which of you two gurus to, to go along with. Our trials work is freely available. I've asked Mr Edwards for results from his work and I'm still waiting to see those results. It's probably a fault of the post, isn't it, Mr Edwards? I think, no, I think it would be fair to say that my work is primary for the benefit of my clients, whereas ADAs, of course, have to work for the community at large. Do you think, though, there's... Do you think you've reached the end of the road as far as research? Do you envisage that you'll be changing your mind in the light of further research that you do or that other people do? One must always be prepared to develop one's knowledge and change as one sees new varieties, new techniques, new materials becoming available. And, and, Mr. Archer, do you think that we've learned all we're going to learn about rape, or are we going to have to, a few more facts come to your attention next year? Without doubt, there is always gaps in our knowledge, but I think we understand the main NPK requirements of the crop fairly well. And you're still satisfied that sulphur won't be necessary? I think I'd keep a very open mind on the sulphur question. Well, it's all very confusing for people like me. Uh, it's quite clear that a great deal of research will have to be done. Uh, whether it'll be done by people who pay Mr. Edwards or whether it'll be done by ADAS, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. In part two, a progress report on that winter wheat crop. That's in a couple of minutes. If you're a sugar beet farmer... The record yield for a wheat crop grown on a field scale is claimed by the NSDO to be held by Essex farmer John Muirhead. Although he himself dislikes any talk of records, it's a fact that a 26-acre field of virtue yielded just under 9,200 weight last year, while his farm average was almost four tonnes. As we discovered last autumn, perhaps the most surprising aspect of John Muirhead's wheat growing system is that all of the seed is broadcast rather than drilled. This field was sown on September the 30th and we thought it would be interesting to go back to the farm to see how the crop was progressing and what sort of treatment potentially record-breaking crops like this one receive. Eastland's farm lies a few feet below sea level on the coast at Bradwell-on-Sea. Nearly all the flat land is a heavy blue alluvial silt clay and half of it is down to wheat. One of the secrets of John Muirhead's success is great attention to detail and the extent of his plant counts and field records puts most farmers to shame. He does counts at one site every hectare and at each site does nine separate counts. The ring is a tenth of a square metre in area. The cross is just to aid counting. He does eight counts around the central point. A ninth count is done at the centre while the tenth is computed as an average of the other nine. The ten figures added together produce the number of plants per square metre. The 23 sites counted in this field averaged out at 308 plants. His record showed that on average 406 seeds per square metre had been sown, thus giving an establishment of 76%, compared with the previous five-year average of 71%. Armed with this incredibly detailed analysis, John Muirhead can then plan his fertiliser programme, as well as check on his own efficiency, 
Peter Innes, who also farms in Essex, had been present when the crop had been sown. Now, four months later, he was back, wanting to know what treatment the crop had received since then. Uh, we rolled it in uh, about a fortnight after it was sown, and we put a pre-emergent on in the beginning of November. That was against blackgrass, John? Yes, principally. Blackgrass and, notes. And in this part of the world, I think you probably use an aphicide then. Yes. Um, this year it has been, it was very necessary. Uh, we might have been a little bit earlier than the ministry recommendation, which was perhaps the second week in November. But we happened to apply it at the beginning of November. Yes, that's unusual. I don't think many of us would do that. Uh, what about broadleaf weed control, John? Have you done anything? Yes, we've given a backup to the Dicurane. Uh, speed wells need to come through, and we put a CMPP type product on. Full rate or? No, no. It'll reduce rate. Going back about the aphicide, we have a lot of this uh, sea wall here, which, uh, inner sea wall and outer sea wall, which does host aphids, and we are becoming more aware of the aphid situation and I say in this particular autumn it was uh, the aphid population was quite high. Could I ask you a bit about the fertilizing of the crop? It's the first weed but you did put something into the seedbed I recollect. Yes it was about 1858-58. So it had some PNK and a little of nitrogen. That's right. Now how much more nitrogen will it receive? Well as a, an estimate I would think about 110, 120 kilograms. So that's approaching 100 units, that sort of order. Yes. Break up. Now, when will that go on? Well, I would expect the first application to go on uh, third week in this month, getting towards the end of this month. I think if the weather hadn't rained, a lot of us might have been tempted to get on in the next day or two. But yes. Um, well, I feel that the plants, uh, the plants are adequate here. We do use nitrogen as a uh, complementary to plant counts to increase tillering or to try to manipulate tillering. In here, we've got as many plants as we need, and it is slightly more difficult to manage from nitrogen point of view because we don't need to put too much early nitrogen on. So the first dose would be what sort of quantity? Uh, 30, 30 units, 30. A, a, bag, a, a bag an acre or a bag and a quarter an acre, whichever rate you use. Yeah. And then the, the next dose would be about stem elongation. Is that the principal thing or do you yes. have a, a late dose where you're going in with quality wheat? Uh, if we're going with quality wheat, yes. But if, if uh, a, a, a wheat doesn't have uh, the inherent uh, characteristics for protein, there's no point in putting late nitrogen on. No, I would agree with that. So this virtue will just get this the rest of its nitrogen in second. In two applications, one, an earlier one and the main major uh, top dressing at stem extension. Now what about your fungicide program? Will you come in against eye spot or it's not? Yes. You yes. will? Uh, we, uh, we will uh, uh, look, but almost invariably all first wheats following a one year break, namely of peas, will receive, or almost invariably receive, a fungicide, an ice spot uh, MBC type MBC fungicide. MBC type, and then you're not worried much then until you're talking about the... Rust the, situation uh, later on. Yes, and septoria, of course, is a big problem with, or can be here, on, as close to the sea as you are. Yes, geographically, septoria is a problem. Lovely looking wheat, a little bit better than mine. All being well, we shall go back at harvest to see that field combined. It will be very interesting to see how it turns out. Next week, we shall be at the NFU AGM, being held this year at its new venue of Kensington Town Hall. Meanwhile, that's all for this week. Goodbye. Slowly mingling with smooth milk chocolate, flies Turkish delight, full of Eastern promise. Polycrop for earlier crops of potatoes, carrots and lettuce. Why not ring Polycrop for information now? Charlesfield 047337 446.